Welcome. Uh, we're going to talk today about building a cloud-friendly application as part of the Platform SH webinar series. My name is Larry Garfield. If you know, uh, don't know me online, I usually go by Krell, at Krell on uh, Twitter and various other places, uh, including the platform uh, support channel. If you want to make fun of me on Twitter during this talk, that's where you do so. I generally encourage it. I'm the Director of Developer Experience here at Platform SH. Uh, that means I work with a lot of uh, varied systems. Uh, well, here, I'm a mem member of the PHP FIG core committee. Uh, it's kind of like the United Nations of PHP with all the good and bad implications that has. And as of last week, I'm the author of Thinking Functionally in PHP, new book from uh, Pack, uh, Lean Publishing, or Lean Pub, so self-published. And stick on to the end. We are going to have a giveaway for a copy of the book. So. Uh, don't leave us just when I stop talking. So let's talk about clouds. Not those clouds. As I mentioned, I, I'm a director of developer experience here at Platform SH. That means I work with a lot of applications trying to get them to play nicely on platform. And I see some that are quite good and some that if you can't see anything nice, don't see anything at all. So I won't. But this is a problem especially for those applications that I'm not going to talk about much because cloud hosting is where everything is moving these days, whether it's platform or another, uh, well, platform, then you know, cloud-based applications, cloud natives, and all this stuff is where things are moving these days. And that's the future. And that's what your application needs to be ready for. But what does that mean? Eh. For that matter, what is a cloud? And I don't mean water vapor. What does it mean when you talk about the cloud? Actually, there are two different questions here. One is what is cloud computing? The other is what is the cloud? And these are different things. These are separate questions with separate answers. The simple one is the cloud is a marketing term that means someone else's hard drive. This is nothing new. This has been the case since the mid 90s, where you outsource hosting and infrastructure to someone else so that you don't have to deal with it. You know, the, the name comes from diagrams in uh, PowerPoints that would have the internet represented as this big pink cloud of I don't know what that whoever is giving the presentation doesn't want to deal with and doesn't actually understand. And we're not really talking about that today. This is a marketing term for outsourcing, digital outsourcing, essentially. That's not what we're here to talk about. What we're here to talk about is cloud computing. Cloud computing is all about abstracting away physical infrastructure so that you can think of your system, your logical system, separately from a physical object. Your lo logical computer system, your Linux system or whatever that you're running is divorced from a physical box with a CPU in it. This is usually, but not always implemented in the cloud. You can absolutely run your own cloud computing environment on your own hardware. It's just usually more trouble than it's worth, but not always. But what this enables is disposable application design. Disposable application design is you may have heard the phrase, treat your systems like cattle, not pets, so that you can, in case of a problem, just delete an environment, delete a system and recreate it logically without having to mess around with hardware. Same idea applied to your application. This means, how do you upgrade your application? You delete it and install a new version because the entire system is disposable and that gives you a lot of flexibility. But to get that flexibility, you need to have your application built in certain ways that are going to play nice with that type of environment where you don't have the server that you are tweaking in place anymore. So what exactly makes an application cloud friendly? A lot of things, a lot of things that don't. I want to go through some guidelines and heuristics that I have found while working on a bunch of different systems to see what works and what doesn't. As I said, these are guidelines, not absolute rules. 
in most cases, but these will serve you well in terms of making your application well suited to a cloud computing environment. First, split your code from your content. This seems obvious at first, but you'd be amazed how easy it is to get this part wrong. What do we mean by code? By code, we're talking about stuff provided by the developer. It is, it is uh, carefully tested before it goes live, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And it lives canonically in a version control system of some kind, these days usually Git, right? Right. And in runtime, it is read-only. You don't want the code to be writable in production. This is good for security, it, because then if your system is attacked, you cannot overwrite the code. You want to read only file system, so it, they cannot modify the code in place. It gives you an audit trail, because it means that changes cannot happen unless they go through your version control system, which means you have a paper trail of who did what. It also means that you can't then hack code in production to hotfix something and then lose that fix again the next time you deploy the normal way. All of those are bad things. All of those are solved by having your code on a read-only file system. You want that. Content, on the other hand, is provided by users, usually ad hoc without any kind of testing or structure to it. And it canonically lives on a file system or a database of some kind, could be anything, MySQL, Postgres, Mongo, Amazon S3, doesn't matter. Some kind of writable system that you are going to be making changes to at runtime. Please don't confuse these. Please do not put these on the same file system. They can be a two different local mounts, that's okay, but you cannot have a directory that is both writable and not writable at the same time. That doesn't actually work, that's not a thing. So make sure that a given directory contains only code or content, things that come from the developer or things that come from the user. Do not put both of those in the same directory because your application may be disposable, but your data is not. If your data is disposable, then you don't actually have a production site, you just have a testing site. Congratulations. Your typical site's workflow is going to look something like this. You are working in development on your local environment or uh, the staging environments like platform provides and pushing and pulling uh, source code in Git or some other version control system. At certain points, you're going to take out a copy of that source code from Git and build it. That build process can be compiling, uh, compiling code if you're writing in Go or Java or some other compiled system. It could be installing third-party dependencies using Composer or PIP or Bundle or uh, NPM or whatever your package manager of choice is. It could be compiling SAS or less, could be compressing your JavaScript, it could be running Webpack. There's always some kind of step to go from source code to thing that runs, and that's your build process. The output of that build process is a build artifact that you're then going to slot into your production environment where there is already data waiting for it on a separate partition, either a separate local partition or a network partition or S3 share or whatever. And that is your production environment. You will then periodically take snapshots of your production data and clone that to your development or testing environments. That is a different workflow than the application. Note those lines may both be going clockwise, but they don't overlap. App ends at production, data starts there and then moves on. You do not get an in-between option between application and data. Everything is going to be one or the other. That includes things like images provided by a module, images provided by your application should be in a separate directory from images provided by users. If you need those to be in the same directory, okay, how? Those are you, it can be writable for the user data and not writable for the stuff provided by your code. Now what? Those have to stay in separate directories. Honestly, that 
that one right there is the most one of the most common bugs that I've seen of applications that don't get this right. They, they confuse developer provided content with user content. So clearly, clearly separate your dev provided and user provided files. Whether they're technically executable code or not, they have to be kept separate from each other. All right, what about configuration? What is configuration? Does it come from the developer or the user? Is configuration something stored in Git or stored in the database? Could be either. There's no wrong answer here other than both. Usually this is not an issue for a bespoke application, a custom built application where configuration is the developer hard coded something or the developer uh, wrote some YAML file, because it's always YAML these days, that is then checked into version control and that drives the system. That is definitely code. If the user is pushing buttons, however, this is much more common with uh, content management systems or other pre-made applications that you're not customizing, you are configuring, then the whole point of the application is that the user can change the, the system by pushing buttons in the UI. And that can be very helpful, but that means configuration is now content, not code, which means it lives in the database and you cannot version control it. Is that a good trade-off or a bad trade-off? I don't know, it's your application, you tell me. But you have to make that decision. The most robust answer to this I've seen is actually the Drupal 8 configuration management system. In Drupal 8 and later, configuration is mostly done in the user interface and stored into an SQL database. But it then is, has the ability to be exported cleanly to a giant directory full of YAML files. The directory of YAML files, you can then commit to Git and then push and pull to get to production like any other code. And then once you get to, to, pro to production, you import that giant directory of YAML back into the database. And now you've updated your configuration after making changes separately in the development environment. This works, but it is horribly over-engineered for the vast majority of use cases. There's an awful lot of fiddly bits I haven't gone into here that make this wildly complicated. For the vast majority of cases, don't bother with that. Simply decide where you want configuration to, to come from, whether it is something the developer provides exclusively or the user provides exclusively, and accept that there are trade-offs to that. And what trade-offs do you want to have are up to you, but you do need to decide. Pick one or the other and stick with it. Next, what happens at runtime stays at runtime. What does that mean? It means your application, that built artifact, is going to slot into data in production. There's going to, when you deploy your application, there will already be its files sitting there on disk. There will already be a database for it to connect to, which has its own data. Your search service, your caching service, all of those will already be there. But they're going to be different between production and staging and your other staging, whether you're doing a, a three-tier dev stage prod or you're doing a, a more robust uh, an environment setup like platform offers where every branch is a uh, testing environment. Either way, you're going to have a different instance of the database and a different copy of data for every environment you're running in. And that includes local too. This also means if you're doing any kind of auto scaling or multi-head environment, you also need to keep track of these services may be different, which means you can assume nothing about your environment in the application itself. Your application code needs to not have hard-coded paths, hard-coded information about its relationship to other services, to the environment. Instead, you need to dependency inject your environment. What does that mean? Any database credentials you have, which includes any other service, not just your primary database, any other server you're going to talk to, you as a, a user, you as the developer, shouldn't even know what those are. They should be passed into your application in the environment, from the environment itself, <clears throat> rather than something you build into the application. 
and then it can be different in each environment. API keys. You really don't want to have your production payment gateway credentials used on your local laptop. Bad things happen with that. Inject your API keys. Any path on disk. You can have a path relative to your application route. That's okay because that's still within your application. But the path on disk in which your application lives should not be hard-coded into the application because it could be different in different environments. Any domain name. It's your, you know, your production site and your testing site are running on separate domain names, I would hope. If they're not, then you, you don't have a separate production. Everyone has a testing server. Some people are lucky enough to also have a separate production instance. Those are going to be on different domains. So don't hard code the domain name into your application anywhere or that won't work. Have that passed in from the environment. It also means don't put these in the database either because when you clone the database, you clone your data set from production to some other environment, it's also now wrong. Your testing environment is going to have some other domain and if all of the links in it are, or the content is still trying to point back to the main domain, you can't actually test it. You'll still end up back on your production site. So how do we inject this information cleanly? The standard way of doing this, environment variables. The way to do so varies by language. Here's a couple of examples. You know, like different application frameworks have abstraction layers over this, cool, whatever, but you need to have some way to inject environment variables into your application, or rather your application should be reading from environment variables to get this information. But you don't always control what those environment variables are going to be. You may want to name it foo or bar or db URL or cache URL, but the host you're on, the environment you're on may be calling it Redis URL instead of cache URL or may have a different structure for it and may offer it in a series of separate keys rather than a URL format or vice versa because no one can standardize that. So you're going to have to have some way to translate the environment provided information into the environment variables your application expects, which means you're going to need a place for glue code. The mechanism can vary by the application, but you need to have a place for implementers to put that kind of glue code so that they can glue their application to whatever environment it's running in cleanly. The way to do this is going to vary for every host you're on and every different type of environment. That's okay. That's why you need this flexibility. You need this place to put this kind of glue code. As an example, this is what uh, our glue code looked like for platform back in Symfony 3. Don't worry about the details, they're not important. In our case, um, we provide the database credentials as part of a Base64 encoded JSON blob called platform relationships. So we have code that grabs that variable, decodes it, make, turns it back to the JSON object, and then pulls out values and shoves it into the dependency injection container in Symfony because that's where it wants it. And Symfony also wants something called a kernel secret as a parameter. And so we have, we provide a, uh, an entropy value called platform project entropy. And so we just map that across. Again, don't worry about the details. Just it's fairly basic, boring code, just mapping from one data structure to another, but that's going to be different for every host and uh, application combination. For example, Symfony 4 changed that and they, they don't have a place to do that kind of glue code anymore. So we wrote a bridge library that does basically the same thing, but does it doing, during the composer autoload phase. So that looks roughly like this. Same thing, but now we're using a wrapper library uh, that we built to make it a bit easier to access the environment variables. It's optional, but it gets the job done. We're doing exactly the same thing here. Symfony 4 now calls it app secret. So, all right, we map to app secret, fine. Uh, map the database across, we can map a mailer. We have these configuration libraries available for a number of languages. If you're in JavaScript, for example, in Node, then it looks more like this, config.credentials uh, database after requiring our config file, our, our config library. 
create the connection by just pulling the values out of that credentials value. And that's just wrapping that same JSON decode, base64 decode we saw before. <clears throat> and then the port to listen on for the application is down on the last line. Same basic idea in Go. We have a library there, which is just wrapping environment variables to make them a bit easier to work with. In this case, because of the way Go works, we have a, uh, a helper lab module that you can then uh, read the configuration off of that. Java, same basic idea, just done Java style. If you're not familiar with any of these particular languages, that's totally fine. The point is it's not a lot of code, but you need to have a place to put that code to connect things together. But what then do you do in local when you know, you're working locally on your laptop, you don't have these environment variables set up? That's what .env files are for. .env is a standard used by a number of different languages now where your application will, when it boots, say, all right, I'm looking, I know I'm looking for an environment variable called foo, there isn't one defined. So I'll look at this file called .env, which is just a bunch of key value pairs and I'll pull out the value in that file and use that instead of a real environment variable. So it's a, a sh another form of glue code essentially. And again, there are lots of .env type libraries in every language, pick one, doesn't matter which one, I don't care but use one of them and never, ever, ever, ever commit the .env file to your repository. This is a local file only. In production, you do not use it. In production, you use real environment variables provided by your, uh, your host or your glue code from the environment because if not, guess what? This file will then end up getting used in all of your different staging environments and everything gets confused. Do not do that. Make sure this is in your git ignore file. Also think about trusted domains. A lot of applications have the ability to, to say only accept requests for this particular domain. That helps avoid spoofing attacks where you send a request to server A with the host name of server B and you can do a cache poisoning attack that way. This is a way to resolve that. But what's the trusted domain? That's gonna depend, are you in production or staging or local or this, your other staging? That needs to be injected too. Not in the code, not in the database. A lot of older systems especially uh, try to do configuration with constants or even worse, static configuration files like a YAML or an XML or an any file where you cannot parse information at runtime. This is terrible because then you cannot make that dynamic depending on the environment. Static configuration files with no ability to pull from the environment are not cloud friendly, end of story. Static files cannot read the environment at runtime. Don't do that. Takeaway here, dependency inject your environment. Make sure that your system, your code does not have any hard coded assumptions about where it's running or what it's talking to. Provide that via the environment. The most important example of that though, are user configured connections to other services. A lot of systems let you configure through the UI what search server or cache server or whatever you're talking to. And that gets really, really tricky for all the reasons we just mentioned because those have to vary by environment, but if they're data, they really can't. The worst example here are installers. What does your typical installer do? Well, it first asks for database credentials then some basic site information. Then it writes all of that to a config file somewhere, to some initial database population for setting up tables and uh, some initial content, whatever. And then it writes that basic site information into the database or possibly a config file, and you're done. Unfortunately, that does not work in a cloud environment at all. Why? Well, there's that whole write credentials to file when you cannot write to file. <clears throat> and if you try to write, you know, it, it's a file that needs to vary by environment. Also ask for database credentials. I don't know what they are. They're provided in environment variables. I don't want to know what my database credentials are. That's something that should be set up by the environment so that I don't have to think about it. I shouldn't know what those are. So what do you do instead? Better installers, and there are some of these, include the connection glue up front 
or let you pre-include the connection glue. And then the installer can detect, oh, I've already got this information for the database or whatever in the environment, so I won't even bother asking the user. And then they don't install any additional code. They can download data like translations or sample content or something like that, that goes in the database, that's fine. But an installer that tries to download additional modules at runtime is incompatible with a cloud-based environment. So don't do that. You also need to be aware of lock-in, as in avoiding it. You always want to take to be able to take your business elsewhere. If you are running any kind of business and you're relying on a third party, have a contingency plan. You need to be able to keep your providers honest, even the ones you like, like platform. I, I like us, I'm hoping you do. You need to have that escape clause. You need to have the ability to take your business elsewhere as a way to keep them honest. <clears throat> because if you are dependent on them, then you are dependent on them and, and you are beholden to what they want. The way to do that, focus on using free software. Use replaceable services only. That means yeah, if a business that you're using a provider goes out of business or they change their prices or they change their terms of service in ways that are incompatible with your business and you are using their proprietary system, well, too bad. You don't have an option. If you are having them host free software for you, then you can take your business elsewhere. Think this doesn't happen? This is just a partial list as of 2015 of all the various services Google has killed. All of these third party providers have their best interest in mind. You need to be responsible for keeping your best interest in mind. So what's safe? Your standard open source tool chain. Any of these standard open source tools are fine because if your provider goes out of business, changes my pricing, changes the terms of service in a way you don't like, you have the option then to host any of these yourself. Not that you're going to, but it means you can also download your data and ask someone else to host it for you. You actually have a competitive market, you have somewhere else you can go. On the other hand, if you're using one of these systems that is proprietary and specific to a given host, a given provider, and they change, then too bad. If your application cannot run with a without AWS Lambda, guess what? You are now 100% dependent on AWS Lambda. And Amazon can completely destroy your pricing model in an instant. Don't leave yourself dependent on one provider for your business existing. I'm not against using these services. They're fine. You know, I want you to use platform, but don't allow yourself to have a hard dependency that you cannot replace on any given provider. This is not a problem of cloud computing per se. It's a problem of outsourcing. So it's the cloud problem, but it's something you need to keep in mind. And finally, you cannot talk about the cloud without microservices because microservices are the hot topic and everyone knows that the point of microservices is that you can use cloud computing and cloud computing enables microservice architectures and that's wonderful. Great. What is a microservice? There is no industry consensus yet regarding the properties of microservices and an official definition is missing as well. Thanks. That's not helpful. Okay. I was able to piece together from Wikipedia and Martin Fowler and a couple of other sources, a decent summary of what microservice design actually means besides just the buzzword. It is an architecture where you have a series of single purpose components that are talking to each other over dumb pipes, not a custom pr protocol. They're talking over your basic plain HTTP, REST, some kind of IPC calls, generic IPC calls, but not an application specific uh, protocol. They are built by separate 
teams. This is important. You have a separate team working on each of these components. And each of these components has an independent release cycle. They can all be released at different times on their own schedules without breaking each other. Fundamentally, this means every microservice should be treating every other microservice as if it were a third party company. The fact that both teams happen to work for the same company is incidental to the architecture. The architecture is designed to assume that they are in fact separate companies. And there are a number of benefits to this approach. For one, you can use different tools and different languages for different parts of the application. If you want to use Postgres with Go for your user store, and you want to use um, Python and MySQL for your payment gateway, and your front end application is MySQL and PHP, cool, no problem. You can mix and match languages like that just fine. You get small focused interdisciplinary teams. This means the user backend has a database person and it has a, a Go developer, maybe two Go developers, a project manager, that one probably doesn't need a UI, but an API designer dedicated to that service. And you have a completely different set of people who are working on the front end. So you have you know, a couple of PHP developers, a database person, a graphic designer, an interface designer, or a front end developer, whatever your teams are, you have a mix of skills in each of these small little teams. These give you a very strong separation of concerns. If users are handled over here by this team and uh, payment is handled separately over here by this team, it becomes really hard to accidentally mix the two, which separation of concerns is a good thing. All right. It allows you to scale and evolve them separately. If you decide after some point, you know what? Python isn't just hacking it. It just isn't hacking it for our payment system right now or anymore. All right, we can port that to some of the language. We can replace it with a different framework. We can do whatever independently of the others. As long as whatever that REST API is between them doesn't change, you can rewrite it from one language to another very easily without breaking anything else. All of these benefits revolve around the fact that it is separate teams working on each of these applications. If you have one team building multiple microservice instances, you no longer have the benefits of microservices. You have one team that is overworked. Fundamentally, the point of microservices is to leverage Conway's law for architectural purposes. This is John Conway. Any organization that designs a system will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. We've all seen this, you know, the, the website's uh, menu structure and IA on the front page has to be based on the department structure because each department head insists on having their section that they can control, which they never do. That's Conway's law in action. With microservices, you are leveraging this deliberately to have different teams working separately. Therefore, you get separate sub pieces of your application working separately. That is the point of microservices is to have leverage Conway's law to have separate teams building separate pieces. And this does have some drawbacks though. Everything does. The biggest one, network latency. The cost of calling from a function to another function within one application is measured in nanoseconds. The cost of calling from a function in one application to a function in another application on another server is measured in milliseconds. That's tens of thousands of times slower for that call. So all of your performance criteria change. You have now have a whole lot of new points of failure, points plural, because when you have a call from one function to another, your point of failure is a uh, bug or sunspots, you know, cosmic background radiation that might interfere with your RAM. But these days you have error correcting RAM, so it's gonna be fine. If you're connecting to another service over the network, guess what? You now have 18 more pieces of hardware that could physically break, as well as a dozen additional pieces of software in the way that could have bugs in them. And that means things are going to break a lot more often, like orders of magnitude more often. 
if you need to refactor something and say, hey, this, this doesn't make sense in the user system anymore, it really should be over in the payment system, you can't just copy and paste the code over. It's different teams, might be different languages. You're gonna to have to just rewrite it. So refactoring becomes harder at the looking at the big picture. Also, you're now dealing with APIs, which means you're dealing with API versioning. If you've worked with API versioning in the past on you know, REST APIs, then you know that there are three or four different ways of handling API versioning, all of them wrong, all of them buggy, all of them terrible. And guess what? You're you have to deal with that internally within your system because you can't control when some other microservice team is going to roll out a new version. It means you need more people. You need to have a, you know, if you have a microservice architecture with five microservices, that means you need five project managers. You need at least two developers on each one. So that's 10 developers. You may need database people. You may need front end people. You need more people because you have more overhead because you have more teams. Depending on the language, there may be different trade-offs for it. PHP, for example, is really well suited for cloud because of its shared nothing architecture, because it's really easy to scale horizontally, really easy to scale vertically. Um, it, it handles a stateless environment really well, but that it does it by pushing all the startup cost onto each process, which means you have an extra two to five milliseconds, if you're lucky, of overhead, could be up to like 30 milliseconds of overhead on every request. If every request from a user is going to end up pinging four other backend services and you have say 20 milliseconds of overhead for the process on each one of those, you've now added 80 milliseconds to every single user interaction, just walking, just starting PHP. And that's even before you start talking about walking over the network. So your performance is terrible in this case or potentially quite terrible. So in a microservices architecture, you need to keep in mind different languages have different performance profiles. As they say on the internet, if one of your microservices going down means the others don't work, you don't have a microservice. You have a distributed monolith. That is all of the same issues you had in a monolith before, but now you have to deal with networks and that just makes everything worse. Hey. Now this can be a good trade-off if you are Amazon or Netflix or Google, but if you are not Amazon or Netflix or Google, then what's better? What's better in most cases, not all, in most cases, what I find to be a better approach is what I like to call a multimodal monolith because I am a big fan of alliteration. A multimodal monolith is built by a single team working together, <clears throat> but building discrete components that all deploy at the same time. They may even be part of the same code base, usually all in the same language. It's not a hard requirement, but usually it's all going to be in the same language. And it's okay for them to share data source. With microservices, you, you know, they, you have a different instance of your database. Even if everything is using MongoDB as its backend, every microservice instance has, or every component has its own MongoDB database. In a multimodal monolith, it's okay if they are all share the same database. And frankly, you have probably done this already at some point in your career. What do I mean? Cron jobs. If you have a task that needs to be done, but doesn't need to be done immediately, you push it off to a cron, cron task to do later. That could be a worker, it could just be a scheduled task. Um, this is usually still the same application code, just with a different entry point. A number of applications have a separate admin application of some kind, that's still using most of the same backend code, but has different front end code. It could just be a different URL on the same application, but that means you could also deploy that application twice in two separate containers, same app, same code base, just deployed twice. One of them is on an admin URL. The other one is on an end user URL. And then you can scale those independently of each other. 
give fewer resources to the admin application, there's only four or five admins, but scale up the user front end dramatically and give it a different performance profile. Queue workers, if you have, you know, you need to send a whole bunch of emails when someone, when a user does something, don't do that in the web request, kick that off to a queue and then have queue workers turn through that on the side. You may have an API application of some kind, just like you have a separate admin application. A lot of systems will have their main application and then an API front end that talks to the same back end. That can also be a, an example of a multimodal monolith using 90% the same code, but a different front end, a different router, for example, but the same, um, you know, same database logic, the same business models and so forth. You've probably done at least one of these at some point in your career. And these could be all in one big language. They could be separate containers. They could be one container, a lot of different ways to do this. But what do they have in common? What do all of these examples have in common? They all are cutting on an asynchronous boundary. Any given user request only touches on one service. An API request touches the API instance and not the user instance. A admin instance touches the admin application and not the queue worker. While the queue worker is running, it is a separate process from and does not talk to an active user web request and vice versa. User request comes in, it may kick off a message to a queue server, but it isn't going to get blocked by, oh, the queue server is busy right now. <coughs> This model, PHP is actually really well suited to because it can scale horizontally very, very easily. And you can have, you know, just include different pieces of it and have different front ends. Other languages can do it too, that's fine. I've seen this implemented in Java, you can do it in Go. But again, different languages optimize for different use cases and PHP does this one especially well. It is still more involved than just having one big monolithic application that does everything, but it is vastly less complicated than a true microservices architecture. And then all of these pieces deploy at once together, which is something Platform SH does really, really well. We support multimodal monoliths through the multi-application support we have, where you have the same code base built to multiple different application instances or different directories within the same Git repository that are separate code bases that deploy uh, to separate applications, but they all deploy at once together. So you don't need to worry about version control between versioning uh, APIs between them because they all are gonna change at once. And this gives you, you know, then a single database to talk to. So you don't need to, you know, have layers upon layers of REST APIs just to get to your original data. So overall then, if we can summarize this, don't assume things. Do not assume what your environment is going to be. Do not, do not assume the number of web heads you're going to have in your application. It may vary. Do not assume what your connection information is. It's going to vary. Do not assume what your domain name is. It's going to vary. Do not assume that you can write to every directory on disk. You will not be able to. And so you have to be careful of what data you're writing where and what data is just not something that runtime should have any say in. Do not assume that a third party service that you are depending on is going to be there forever. It may not be. Do not assume that you are big enough and complex enough for microservices. Odds are you're not. So you probably would be better served by a multimodal monolith than by traditional microservices. Thank you very much. Again, my name is Larry Garfield, Director of Developer Experience here at Platform SH.